on this episode of Boxing World Weekly. Gilberto Ramirez makes his mark. The new generation has arrived, and a showdown no one can wait for. There is a Mexican force adding heat to an already spicy weight class in 2022, and that is light heavyweight. He is coming for the belts, and it's not the brand name kind that usually comes to mind. It's the undefeated knockout artist and former super middleweight champion, Gilberto Zerto Ramirez. He has been an ingredient in this sport for over a decade, debuting in the pro ranks back in 2009, when he was just 17 years old. He took advantage of the fact that he could fight professionally in his home country at that age and thus began his surge to world titles. There's a reason why they are called Mexican warriors. It's because spicing things up is ingrained in their blood. In the first 13 months, Ramirez fought 12 times, winning every single time. From 09 to 2015, he fought more than once in every single calendar year, accumulating a record of 33-0 in just six years. That was good enough to get him his first world title shot in 2016, a fight against reigning and defending WBO super middleweight champion Arthur Abraham, who also had no shortage of recipes at 44 and 4. A tough test was actually an easy result. Ramirez won by a wide unanimous decision, achieving the brand name world champion status. He would defend it five times against undefeated contenders like Jesse Hart twice and Romer Alexis Angulo. But at six foot two with a 75 inch reach, he was massive for 168 and there was still more he wanted to achieve. So he made the move up a shelf to light heavyweight. After getting through veteran gatekeepers like Tommy Carpensi and Alfonso Lopez III, his first real test at the new weight came against the big and tough Sullivan Barrera, who had previously fought Andre Ward, Joe Smith Jr., Dimitri Bivol, and also Hart. In Ramirez's six world title fights at 168, only once did he come away with enough heat to finish an opponent, which was odd considering his rise to the top was so spicy. But since his move up to 175, the power has returned. He passed the Barrera test with flying colors, knocking him out in four. This has been the norm for him at light heavyweight. Five fights, five knockouts. At 44-0 with 30 knockouts, he has made his case. He is ready for a world title shot, or at the very least a fight against the top contenders, considering Arthur Bitterbiev just beat Joe Smith Jr. on June 18th in a three-belt unification battle. Dimitri Bilbo is coming off his massive win over Canelo Alvarez and is rumored to be looking at Bitterbiev to crown an undisputed champion. Other options for Bivol are reportedly Joshua Buatzi and Ramirez. The time might finally be here, where Zerto gets his shot at late heavyweight gold against the man to beat in the division, Dimitri Bivol. A matchup that brings a lot of intrigue. Zerto is the bigger and longer man, but it's hard to give him an edge when Bivol just outdid the best in the sport. But maybe he can do what Canelo couldn't. Ramirez might also carry more power, and given the fact he is a natural 175, he might have what it takes to beat the man who beat the man. Canelo has won a world title at 175 and has tested the waters again since then, albeit unsuccessfully. However, it's almost a guarantee he will be back at some point. But for now, the Mexican spice to watch out for in this very powerful division is Gilberto Zerto Ramirez. If you love the fights, make sure to check out more Boxing World Weekly exclusives on YouTube. Full fights, extended interviews, and everything else a fight fan could want. Coming up on Boxing World Weekly, Ortiz returns and a must-see lightweight clash. Boxing World Weekly attended the virtual roundtable for Virgil Ortiz Jr. ahead of his fight against Michael McKenzie on August 6th. 
Here are the highlights. If I, if I went against Michael McKinson, you know, Michael McKinson, he's ranked in the WBO. He's undefeated. It, it would really uh, go to my resume if I beat him. You know, he's a good fighter. You're also the number one contender in three of those four sanctioning bodies. Do you want to wait for Spence versus Crawford to happen, or would you like to jump in there against one of them before it happens? Uh, I mean, it really doesn't matter. It's I, I want my shot with, with whoever. It, it honestly doesn't matter to me. I mean, I'm not sure. You know, it's uh, it, it honestly really is a 50-50 fight to me. I feel like they're both good at what they both do. You know, they're both, they, well, they both can be southpaws. Arrows are southpaw and uh, Crawford, you know, he switches. He's a switch hitter. Uh, we're, we're just gonna have to wait and see. I really don't know. I mean, you know, we just, uh, we just make some changes here and there. I mean, not huge changes. But overall, I, I feel 100% now. You know, we're ready to go, and uh, we're just gonna do what we do best. Uh, I'm, I really want to get back into the ring now. By the time I fight in August, it'll be almost a whole year. So I, I would love to uh, to fight at least twice this year, definitely. And I would love to stay even more busier the following year. I've learned uh, things from all the different coaches that I that I've been with. You know. Uh, every coach has their own point of view, different, different style. Um, one thing I've learned from Manny is uh, like be really explosive with your punches. You know, don't don't waste time to react. Don't think about it because if you think about it, you know, you get stuck and then you know you can make a mistake off of that. I'm not the one sending the contracts or negotiating or anything like that. But from what my manager has told me, we sent them a contract. Well, no, they negotiated and they agreed. And when we sent them the contract, they they were sitting on it for like four and a half weeks, and we didn't hear anything since. We, I mean, it's not a knock on David himself, or because we don't know if he said no, or if his managers or management said no. All I know is that we haven't heard anything. Just know that I'm I'm back. I'm better. I'm stronger. I and I'm more than happy, excited to be back in the ring, obviously. With record-breaking gates, constant drawing power, incredible global appeal, boxing is clearly in a good position halfway through 2022. And even with the biggest stars in the sport beginning to approach the tail end of their careers, the next generation appears to have no issues with keeping the punches rolling. This week's top five are the five top boxers under 25 years old. Coming in to take over at number five, 24 year old former unified lightweight champion, Tiafimo Lopez. The Brooklyn native set the 135 pound division on fire with his breathtaking knockouts that led to his first shot at a world title in just his 15th fight. In less than two rounds, Lopez would knock out Richard Comey for the IBF title, setting himself up to face unified champ, Vasily Lomachenko. Tia would shock the world, upsetting Loma and claiming three of the four belts. He would lose the titles in his next bout, but with his body already outgrowing the weight division, Lopez would look to take over the 140 pound division going forward. 18 fights, 18 knockouts, and only 24 years old, entering at number four, Virgil Ortiz Jr. He hit the ground running once he turned pro and had zero intentions of slowing down absolutely destroying everyone in front of him with none lasting longer than eight rounds. Many experts had concern on how Ortiz would handle stiffer competition, and in 2021, Ortiz silenced those so-called experts. The American would shut down former world champ Maurice Hooker with a seventh round thumping before facing adversity against Aegis Cavalaskis. Ortiz would appear to be hurt in the second round, but regrouped and finished Cavalaskis in the eighth. The power is undeniable, and Ortiz plans on making every welterweight feel it. On the doorsteps of a title shot, 29-0 with 27 knockouts, Duran Boots Ennis smashes his way into the third position. Ennis opened a lot of eyes when he handed former world champion Sergei Lipinets his first knockout loss. Boots followed it up with a clobbering of Thomas Delorme and put the cherry on top of his campaign to a world title shot crushing the undefeated Castillo Clayton to become the mandatory IBF challenger. Few have shown interest in fighting Ennis, and for very good reason. But sooner or later, they'll all be forced to deal with him. 
Imagine winning a silver medal at 19 years old in 2016 Olympics and being overlooked in the conversation of boxing's future. That's exactly how 18-0 Shakur Stevenson felt and took a show and prove approach, chopping down every opponent with his scintillating speed and exceptional defensive skills. The world was put on notice when he won the vacant WBO featherweight title only to vacate, move up a weight class, and win the WBO super featherweight title just four fights later. Stevenson would cement his place in the sweet science after defeating the man he was chasing, then WBC super featherweight champ Oscar Valdez becoming a two division champ worthy of claiming the number two spot. There's no debate on who sits atop the mountain on this list. The first and youngest undisputed lightweight champion in the four belt era, Devin the Dream Haney. In his most recent outing, he went into enemy territory pitting his WBC title against then unified champ George Cambosis Jr. Haney would dismantle the Aussie, showcasing his remarkable boxing IQ, piston-like jab, and ability to remain focused in high-profile situations. At 23 years old, 28-0, and still developing, Haney has already exceeded expectations. It's clear he will look to keep the dream alive, but for the rest of the division, the nightmare has just begun. There are a lot of great young stars in boxing, from Olympians to boxers from fighting families to just natural born juggernauts, and they all have the goal of a world title. But despite the tenacity of youth, they are still pretty hard to get. In this week's Boxing World Weekly Trivia, we want to know, who was the youngest fighter ever to win a world title? The answer when we return. If you love the fights, make sure to check out more Boxing World Weekly exclusives on YouTube. Full fights, extended interviews, and everything else a fight fan could want. After the break on Boxing World Weekly, the scoring debate, and big things from small packages. Welcome back to Boxing World Weekly. Before the break, we asked, who was the youngest fighter ever to win a world title? The answer, Wilfred Benitez. In March 1976, Benitez captured the WBC World Super Lightweight title from Antonio Cervantes at the ripe old age of 17. The idea of open scoring in any combat sport usually ends in half the fans being for it, the other half against it. Boxing fans are no different, which begs the question, what would happen if open scoring became a regular thing? The number one standard argument fans use to condemn open scoring is coasting. If fighters know they're ahead, they're more than likely to coast to victory, which affects the sport and how the public perceives it. Fans won't want to buy a ticket or buy the pay-per-view if they know halfway through the action's going to slow down because one fighter is more cautious knowing he's up or changing their style completely to lower the risk-reward ratio. And before you criticize the fighter, ask yourself, would you work twice as hard or would you slow down your work rate knowing you're going to get paid the same? That's what I thought. Second, implementing open scoring could influence judges to be persuaded by a third party for a specific fighter. Think about it. Judges don't make a ridiculous amount of money, but are paid to work a fight worth millions of dollars. You can argue they might be more susceptible to bribery, extortion, or manipulative behavior. But there's also the safety concern. Imagine judging an important fight with a partisan crowd for a specific fighter, and after six rounds the scores are shown, and the judges have it unanimously for the visiting fighter. They would be afraid. They would be looking over their shoulders for the remainder of the fight, which raises the potential for judges to be distracted. Some would even argue that open scoring takes away from the excitement and appeal that comes with boxing. Unlike basketball or hockey, at the end of the fight, you have to wait for the judges to hand in their scorecards and wait for the announcement. 
Knowing the result before the final bell takes away some of the excitement when fights go the distance, especially if they're close. But what about the flip side to this coin? You can argue almost every point. If one fighter knows he's down three to four rounds, the corner is going to be emphatic about their fighter pushing the pace to either win the round or go for the knockout. That would just raise the excitement of the action and force the fighter ahead to either engage or risk losing points or rounds for timidity. Also, this would show who is the more prepared fighter, who came into the fight with multiple game plans to adapt to any situation. What's the counterpunch to judges being influenced though? While open scoring differs how a judge sees a fight, having it would hold them accountable knowing their score to be visible before the fight's even over. This could impact their overall professionalism as well as their credibility going forward. Let's be honest here, there isn't one boxing fan that wouldn't love to go one on one with a judge who had their favorite fighter losing. In boxing, you have to wait for the final bell to hear the victor. But why? In a sport like hockey, where there's two minutes to go in the third period and a team is up 3-2, the crowd is on their feet so loud it'll give you goosebumps. Now, imagine you're watching a championship fight in the 12th round, and we all know the challenger is up one round. The crowd would be on the verge of eruption with anticipation, knowing the champion needs to get the finish. Deciding if open scoring is beneficial or detrimental to boxing? You be the judge. Your winner by split decision. And still, undefeated and undisputed, If you love the fights, make sure to check out more Boxing World Weekly exclusives on YouTube. Full fights, extended interviews, and everything else a fight fan could want. Up next on Boxing World Weekly, light heavyweight rankings. And all eyes will be watching. An argument can be made that sometimes rivalries are better than belts. That is the case for Gervonta Tank Davis versus Ryan Garcia. Both these fighters are some of the biggest names in the sport right now and looking at their social media followings and who comes out to their fights, millions of people would agree. A must see matchup that has the potential to be modern day's version of Floyd Mayweather versus Oscar De La Hoya. Celebrities, the younger generation, hardcore fans, casuals, anybody who's anybody will be watching this clash. On one side, there's Davis, who has been Mayweather's protege for most of his career. A man who's nicknamed Tank for a reason. A five foot five frame that has the power to play across three weight divisions, which he won titles in each of them. In his 27 boats, Davis has a stunning 25 knockouts. Across the ring is Garcia, who falls under De La Hoya's promotion company. He has lightning quick hands with Thor-like power behind them. He may not have the titles to match Davis, but at 22-0 with 18 KOs, he has a case for being one of the best fighters Tank has faced. To anybody familiar with these fighters know, they do not respect one another. Calling each other out on social media constantly, so people better believe this fight would end in a knockout of the year contender. What makes this matchup even better is both fighters have recently gone through their toughest tests. The only man that was capable of going the full 12 with Tank was Isak Pitbull Cruz at the end of 2021. An action packed, back and forth affair that Davis managed to walk away with a unanimous decision. Garcia's toughest test was at the beginning of 2021 with Luke Campbell for the WBC interim world lightweight title. In the second, Campbell landed a solid punch to Garcia's chin that had everyone watching in shock. But this moment proved beneficial for Garcia as he collected himself and in the seventh it paid off in full. He took his left hand and decimated Campbell's body destroying anything left inside. And since then both fighters have dominated in their most recent outings. Davis settled a rivalry with undefeated contender Roly Romero by knocking him out in six. 
Garcia returned to the ring against the tough veteran Emmanuel to go and cruise to unanimous decision. Two of the hardest punchers at 135. Garcia has a style that relies heavily on his natural speed and reaction time. He will also have a four and a half inch height advantage, which translates to his two and a half inch reach advantage. Mix that in with his power, it could be the deciding factor. But Davis could copy his game plan he implemented on Mario Barrios, who was also a taller and longer world-class opponent. Davis fought on the inside to eliminate his reach and managed to eventually stop him. These two have enough power that they will both need to respect the others. Forget all the belts. Styles make fights for a reason. A must-see matchup to prove who is the better man and silence all critics. This is a make-or-break fight for both. Stop the tweets and sign the dotted lines. In this sweet world of boxing, punching each other in the face is a universal language and no lightweight fight would show that any better than Davis versus Garcia. Here are this week's top five light heavyweights. Callum Smith, Joshua Buatzi, Gilberto Ramirez, Dimitri Bivol, Arthur Bitterbiev. Our fighter of the week is newly crowned three belt light heavyweight king, Arthur Bitterbiev. The only world champion with a perfect knockout ratio continued his streak when he stopped WBO title holder, Joe Smith Jr. in the second round on June 18th. Bitterbiev now has his sights set on Dimitri Bivol to crown the first ever undisputed champion at 175 pounds in the four belt era. And that's it for another round of Boxing World Weekly. Until next time, enjoy the fights.